seems to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody. This is a really cool and special episode. Today, we are going to talk about the city of David. And uh, to have us, uh, or to give us some help with that conversation, I've got Zev Orenstein here. Uh, He's the Director of International Affairs at the City of David Foundation. Now, he's a New Jersey native, but after completing university, moved to Israel in 2003. Uh, We met uh, a little while back when um, Zev came into the office in D.C., and really explained to me the, the fascinating history and, and current situation with the city of David, um, the archaeological discovery discoveries that have been ongoing and, and, its, and its importance to our culture, our history, uh, religions, multiple religions, of course. Uh, so, Zev, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm just going to start in really broad terms. Uh, what is the city of David? So the city of David is the place where Jerusalem began. It's the historic site of biblical Jerusalem. Uh, You have billions of people around the world who feel a connection to Jerusalem. And when you think of the Jerusalem of the Bible, people like King David, King Solomon, prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah, they were hanging out in the city of David. Where is the city of David? If uh, one uh, imagines for a moment Jerusalem and you imagine the Temple Mount, if you imagine the old city of Jerusalem, uh, the city of David is just south of the Temple Mount, just south of the Western Wall. Uh, and if you think of you know, the, the Western Wall, the Temple Mount, if you associate that with 2,000 years ago, uh, around the time period of Jesus, King David is 1,000 years prior to that. Uh, the Hebrew Bible ends about four centuries before Jesus comes into existence. So Jerusalem of the Bible is the city of David. That is where uh, the kings of the Bible are ruling, where the prophets of the Bible are preaching. It's in the city of David uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, just outside the old city walls. Okay, so that's the, that's the city of David. And how long have we known it's right there? Is, 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 there's well, been a lot of I'm recent so- archaeological discoveries, but I think we've known its general location for, for how long? So up until 150 years ago, everyone thought the biblical city of Jerusalem was the old city of Jerusalem, surrounded by the iconic old city walls, which, believe it or not, only date back about 450 years to the Ottoman period. But until 1867, the old city, as far as the world is concerned, that's biblical Jerusalem. Until Queen Victoria of England wants to discover the treasures of the Bible, she sends a man by the name of Captain Charles Warren to search for, among other things, the Ark of the Covenant. And he ends up making an inadvertent discovery. He wants to dig on the Temple Mount. Uh, Back then, just like it is today, it was religiously sensitive, politically sensitive. The Ottomans don't let him dig up the Temple Mount. He realizes he can't go back to the queen empty-handed. So he says if he can't dig on the Temple Mount, the site of the biblical Mount Moriah, if he can't dig there, then he'll dig near it. He comes down from the Temple Mount to the south, and he starts searching uh, around a barren 11-acre ridge. And he starts to make all sorts of connections, and he comes up with a theory that that ridge is the city of David, is biblical Jerusalem. The problem is that at that time, there was almost nothing there. And the whole world, scholar and layman alike, say, Charles, that is the most ridiculous thing we've ever heard. Everyone knows Jerusalem is the old city. Uh, Except over the next 150 years, it turns out that Charles Warren was in fact correct, that the original location of biblical Jerusalem, the place where Jerusalem began, is an 11-acre ridge just outside the walls of the old city, just south of the Temple Mount. And since then, it has become one of the most archaeologically excavated sites in the world, the most excavated site in Israel, where virtually every day, except during Corona, uh, discoveries are being unearthed, which are showing, not simply as a matter of faith, but as a matter of fact, the connection of Jews and Christians to Jerusalem going back thousands of years. Yeah, and, and maybe I want to I want to elaborate on that a little bit. Actually, um, you know why the city, why why who was King David, um, and the importance of, of of King David to Jewish history and and into the history of of that region. 
Can you, can you go into a little bit more detail on that? Sure. So, so King David was the person who essentially united the, the tribes. If you think of like Braveheart in a certain sense, to unite the clans. I, uh, before King David, you had King Saul, but we were not really a united monarchy in the sense of having one sovereign power that really represented everybody. It was after King David came to power that the tribes get together and say to him, we want you to represent all of us. And that's what he does. He expands the borders of, of the kingdom. He defeats the enemies. And ultimately, he's the one that makes Jerusalem the capital uh, of that kingdom. And from that time, that has been the only capital that the Jewish people have ever known in terms of sovereignty. It's been Jerusalem. He's the one that brings the Ark of the Covenant up, up to Jerusalem, which is the city of David, of course, named after King David. And he is the one who wants to build the temple atop the Temple Mount, which is why the Temple Mount is called Temple Mount. It was called Mount Moriah before that. Uh, it's called Temple Mount because the temple was built there uh, during the time not of David, but of, of his son Solomon. That temple stands for over four centuries, destroyed by the Babylonians 2,500 years ago, rebuilt a few decades later, uh, and, and stands until the year 70 when the Romans destroy it. But David is the one who essentially brings about the united uh, kingdom of Israel, and then is the one who makes Jerusalem the capital. He's the one who leads to the building of the temple on the Temple Mount. David is the, I guess you can call him the George Washington of Israel. He is the one who essentially brings, puts our country on the map. Right. Uh, let's talk about Temple Mount for a minute. I'm not sure a lot of people understand the, the significance of the Temple Mount and and why it's why why there is uh, such serious contention um, uh, w b between uh, people of Islamic faith and the Jewish people because of the Temple Mount. So you mentioned uh, it's been destroyed twice. The, the re most recently um, by the Romans in uh, 70 A.D. Uh, and and right now, um, what what's on top of the Temple Mount? So today on the Temple Mount, you have two Islamic shrines. You have the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which, uh, according to Islamic tradition, is their number three holy place after Mecca and Medina. And, and then you have the Dome of the Rock. That is the, what you could say, the iconic uh, structure, the center, center of the Temple Mount with the golden dome on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and those are two Islamic shrines. Now, when you speak of the Dome of the Rock, the rock that's being referred to according to the biblical tradition is what's known as the foundation stone or the place uh, where the world was created. That's the spot where the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis, the famous story of the binding of Isaac, that that takes place there on that site of what is now the Dome of the Rock. But the rock that's being referred to is this place where the story of the binding of Isaac takes place. That's the spot where the two temples stood. And what's happened throughout this region and really into Europe also, one of the ways that if you are if you're a conquering power, if you want to show that my God is better than your God or my ideology is better than your ideology, is you essentially take over the holy places of the people that you defeated. And so when when the Muslims come to Jerusalem, we're talking about already in about 638 or so uh, CE, when they come over, they take over the Temple Mount to show their supremacy, not only just over uh, the Jewish people and Judaism, but also over Christianity. And over the following centuries, there's a long-running feud between Muslims and Christians uh, running through the Crusades and, and onwards uh, over who does Jerusalem belong to, uh, which God in a certain, self, in a certain sense was, was right. Was it the Jewish God, the Christian God, the Muslim God? And in the Middle East, those things are still, uh, I guess, things that people take very seriously. Right, they're uh, hotly debated, and so the the Temple Mount. When when we talk about the Western Wall, so if you go to, into the old city of Jerusalem and you see a lot of people praying into a wall, you see all these um, uh, small pieces of paper where prayers are written onto, and they're stuffed into the cracks of the wall. Um, that's that's the Western Wall, which is it's in which was the the Western Wall of the Temple Mount. Right, it's the only it's the only access that Jews and and I guess Christians also have to the Temple Mount because I I'm I'm not sure I I don't think I can get on top of the Temple Mount even as a I, I'm pretty sure Jewish people cannot. Um, am I correct about that? Okay, so, so so the way it works is the Western Wall is uh, a retaining wall 
that would have held the Temple Mount up. It wasn't a wall of the Temple itself. It, it was a retaining wall of, of the Temple Mount going back about 2,000 years to the time of Herod uh, or to the time of Jesus. That, that's the time period that we're talking about. Now, there are, other, there are other retaining walls around the Temple Mount that also go back that far. Most notably, we're talking about the Southern Wall, the Southern Steps, which have a lot of significance both to Jews and to Christians. Uh, so, so you do have much of the Temple Mount walls that do go back to that time period. Now, going up to the Temple Mount today for non-Muslims is possible but complicated. There are many gates onto the Temple Mount. The only one that non-Muslims can use is the gate right next to the Temple Mount. And non-Muslims have very restricted uh, access. You're talking probably about two hours, three hours or so a day, uh, where, again, Jews, Christians, tourists from wherever, they can go up, but they are given very strict, strict instructions by the Israeli police about what you can't do when you go up to the Temple Mount. So, for instance, if, if you wanted to go up to the Temple Mount and you said, wow, this is a place that's central to my faith, to the Bible— uh, to who I am is, is whether as a Jew, as a Christian, whatever it is, you're not allowed to bring a Bible up with you. You're not allowed to bring a prayer book up with you. You're not allowed to actively uh, recite prayers on the Temple Mount. Uh, and the reason for that is, and if you do that, the Israeli police will, will remove you. Now, you might say, why would Israel do that? And, and it's very simple. It's not that Israel itself has any problem with a Jew or Christian praying up on the Temple Mount. The issue is the Islamic reaction when those things happen. And sadly, uh, the uh, Islamic trust that, that oversees the Temple Mount, it has been a site uh, or a flashpoint for uh, radical extremists uh, uh, from the Muslim faith who are not tolerant of others and the connection that others have to the Temple Mount. And because that has been a flashpoint in terms of causing all sorts of riots and violence and all sorts of other things, Israel generally tries to do everything in its power to avoid lighting the spark of a powder keg, which the Temple Mount represents uh, to Jews and to Muslims and to Christians, but the Muslims are the ones that uh, turn violent around it. And, and so that's, that, that's why there are so many restrictions towards non-Muslims and the access to the Temple Mount. But that said, you could go up if you want to, but it would be a limited limited experience. The reason why this is an important thing to bring up, and, and the, the message is this, that Israel is so tolerant uh, to the point where you're actually enforcing intolerance uh, against your own religion. Um, but that, that's basically what's happening. Absolutely. Um, and yeah. the reason this is important is because as we talk about the city of David, the city of David is technically in East Jerusalem. And for, for outsiders looking in on on you know, what the future of the Israel-Palestine conflict looks like. Oftentimes people talk about just splitting Jerusalem up, like there's already an east and west, you know, there's Palestinians on one side, Jews on the other, just uh, just split it up, what's the big deal? But it's just like any city, nothing is ever that simple. Um, there's a lot of uh, overlap, and, there's, and when it comes to um, important monuments like this or important uh, religious and historical sites like the City of David or the Temple Mount, um, these things are important to a lot of different religions, and only only Israel actually cares about freedom of religion, it would seem to me. Um, it doesn't seem that way. That's just clearly true. And, yeah, and, so, and so the question is, you know, if you just cut these things off, uh, what happens to my ability as a Christian to, to visit the city of David? This, these, are, these are important things we have to wrestle with. I, the, the answer is really very simple. Uh, I if you wanted today, today to visit the Church of the Nativity, uh, it would be very difficult for you to do that. Uh, the Church of the Nativity, which is today in, in Bethlehem, which is under Palestinian control, in the early 2000s, uh, Palestinian terrorists used the church itself as a terror base. It, it's, you look around the region and you see, whether it's ISIS or others, the destruction of antiquities and holy sites of other faiths. I mean, the Middle East, sadly, is not known for its tolerance of, of other people's faiths and religions and beliefs. And the only reason why, you know, we just, we, we just started this, this month, Ramadan. And in a normal time, which we're not in right now with Corona, but normal time, you would have tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of Muslims coming to worship at the Temple Mount, which, again, that's a place that they feel a deep connection to. I respect that. 
but the reason that's possible is because Israel is a sovereign, because you don't find the equivalent anywhere else in the Middle East for Christians or for Jews. Now, when we think of Jerusalem and the sites that make Jerusalem, Jerusalem, for, for Christians and Jews, for billions of people around the world, what are those sites? We're talking about the Church of the Holy Sepulcher or the Garden Tomb. We're talking about the Temple Mount, the Western Wall, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, the City of David. Every single one of those sites, every single site that makes Jerusalem, Jerusalem, religiously and historically significant to all of those people, it's located in what much of the world refers to as East Jerusalem. And as you mentioned, well, what would happen if Jerusalem was not under Israeli sovereignty? We know what would happen, because from 1948 to 1967, when Jordan illegally occupied this area, they blew up every synagogue in the old city. They desecrated tens of thousands of graves in the ancient Jewish cemetery in, on the Mount of Olives. They did not provide any access to the Western Wall. We know what this story looks like. The only way that you can say with absolute certainty that when you visit Israel, when you visit Jerusalem, and you want to go visit the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you want to go visit the City of David, you want to go visit the Mount of Olives, the only way you know that will happen is if it's under Israeli sovereignty. The only reason why all of the three monotheistic faiths have access to their holy places uh, today in Jerusalem is because, as you said, Israel assures and protects the freedom of worship of all those people. And you, you, you look at, for instance, uh, you have a body in the United Nations called UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, uh, and they passed repeated resolutions actually denying the significance of Jerusalem to both Christians and to Jews. They say the Temple Mount and the Western Wall are exclusively Islamic, and they go on to condemn the archaeology in a place like the City of David, again, because every day when we're digging, we're unearthing antiquities that are showing that Jews and Christians have been in Jerusalem for thousands of years, that so much of what's written in the Bible, in terms of the, the people that walk through the pages of the Bible, the events that are described in the Bible as having taken place in Jerusalem, we can actually prove them. And that is what's driving so many in the United Nations, so many in uh, the Middle East, in, in the Palestinian leadership. It drives them crazy because the story that they're telling is that Jesus was a Palestinian, that Jews were never here before, and uh, all the archaeology is fake. And, and so that's what we're up against. So let's talk about the archaeology and, and what's been discovered lately and, and, and the significance of all of that. I mean, what are, what are, what are some of the highlights there? So one of the most significant discoveries, and, and this discovery is significant not just for us as individuals, but, but for our two countries. Uh, 2004, at the very southern end of the city of David, there's a road. Beneath the road, there's a sewage pipe. And in 2004, the sewage pipe explodes. And now you have a big mess. So the municipality, I'm sure you know, you, you're dealing with this uh, in your own way. You have to keep the constituents, uh, make sure the needs are, are, are being taken care of. And so the municipality here... Uh, you know, says, so okay, we got to go in and in construction crews. But Jerusalem is not just another municipality. And the city of David in the heart of the Holy Basin is not just another part of Jerusalem. And so you don't only send in construction crews, you also have to send in archaeologists. Mm -hmm. And the archaeologists are overseeing the repair of the sewage pipe. And they begin, you know, they're, they're, they're watching the bulldozers and dump trucks do their work. And they begin to hear scraping and scratching. It doesn't sound right. They clear everyone out. And it turns out that in repairing the sewage pipe, the construction crews had inadvertently uncovered uh, a set of steps going back some 2,000 years. And there was only one other set of steps the archaeologists knew in Jerusalem that looked just like those steps. And those were the steps, the southern steps leading up into uh, the Temple Mount, up to the temple 2,000 years ago. So they said, well, what are the steps down at the bottom of the city of David? And they realized that they had uncovered the steps leading down to the ancient Pool of Siloam. Now, the Pool of Siloam has deep significance uh, in the Christian scriptures. Uh, it's referred to as a site of the healing of the blind man. And the Bible, of course, talks about that there are three times a year when all of Israel is mandated to make pilgrimage up to the temple on the Temple Mount. We're talking about Passover, Pentecost, tabernacles. And the archaeologists said, well, wait a minute. If we know that now we've discovered the Pool of Siloam, which was the size of two Olympic-sized swimming pools, the reason it was so big is because the historian Josephus says that nearly 3 million people are going on pilgrimage 2,000 years ago up to the temple. We're talking about, again, the time of Jesus 2,000 years ago. They said, why 
why, you know, how does everyone get from the pool all the way up a half mile to the Temple Mount? And so they decide to widen the excavation. And what they discover was the 2,000-year-old pilgrimage road. It's being excavated literally as we speak. It is what you can call the biblical superhighway. It's the road that pretty much almost anyone who's listening to this, to this podcast, your ancestors, my ancestors, they walked on this road 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem when they went on pilgrimage up to the temple. Not a road near there, not stones that look like the ones that are being discovered. It's the actual road. I believe you walked on it about two years ago yeah. uh, when you were in, in the city of David. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, and, it's, and, and it's again, really it's, cool. <laughs> it's underground still. Um, you know, you've got the it, road above you, but it's, it's fascinating. And, and, what's, and what's amazing about this discovery, we had uh, this past June, uh, we had a breakthrough ceremony for the lower half of the pilgrimage road, connecting from the pool of Siloam up to the halfway point, which is where you were when you visited. And it's still not open to the public. And when we had this, this groundbreaking ceremony, we had nearly a dozen officials who came from the Trump administration. And one of the questions I, I received more than any other, which is, okay, we would have understood if Ambassador David Friedman, United States Ambassador to Israel, if he would have come to the ceremony out of respect for the alliance, why did the administration send nearly a dozen officials to this event? Why was it that after the breakthrough ceremony, there was an official dinner in the United States Embassy to celebrate this historic occasion? Why is it so important to America? And what this administration understands, led by United States Ambassador David Friedman, is that the foundations of America, the heritage and values that America is built upon, they have their roots in Jerusalem. And therefore, the pilgrimage road, the Pool of Siloam, the city of David, it's not just significant to the Jewish people and to Israel, but it also holds a deep significance to America as a country, and obviously to tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of Americans. Yeah, and then that's that's absolutely right. You know, I, we often say that um, America is founded on Judeo-Christian history, period. There, there's no other way to, to describe the founding of America and how our founders thought about uh, morality and and the relationship between you know the, the state and and religion, and um, it's 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 incredibly important to protect these things. Uh, I, I want to ask a couple more questions about what we've actually discovered there, and really try to help people visualize this. I mean, right now there's there's the, the goal is to is to continue ex- excavating this tunnel so that people can actually walk all the way down from the, the, the or, or all up from the pool of Siloam to the, to the temple Mount and, and really walk along the same road that, that Jesus walked on. One of the things I thought was cool when I was down there was um, they pointed out a little, you know, cause, cause you're, you're on this like downward sloping road. Um, and, and every once in a while there's, there's sort of a, a series of steps or a pedestal off to the side of the road, which they say is what, is what is what people would use to sort of stand atop and and say whatever it is they were going to say. I guess it's like like uh, you know we, yeah. mo- modern day we've got billboards everywhere, but back then they, I guess they had people just saying things. And so Jesus was of course one of these people, um, and uh, that's there, there, there's a possibility we don't we can't know for sure, but like you you might actually be looking at a place where Jesus stood and and gave sermons. I mean, here's what I can tell you. I mean, obviously, I personally wasn't there 2,000 years ago, so I can't say whether or not he was. But I was asked uh, not long ago by one of your colleagues in the Senate, and he asked me that question. He says, what's the likelihood that, that Jesus walked on this road? And so I said to him, I said, Senator, I don't want to tell you stories. Let me give you a conservative estimate. He said, okay. I said, I said conservatively speaking, the likelihood is 100%. So how do you know? it is very simple. I said 2,000 years ago, Jesus was Jewish. He would have gone with all the other Jews to purify himself in the pool of Siloam. He would have then walked up along the pilgrimage road, that half mile going up through the city of David, coming out of the footsteps of the Western Wall of the Temple Mount of the Southern Steps. That's what everyone was doing 2,000 years ago. Uh, that's what all everyone in Jerusalem, that's what they were doing. If, if you believe there was a historic Jesus 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, he was walking through the city of David. That's, that's, that was the main thoroughfare of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And therefore, whatever was happening in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, including the, the figures 
uh, that, that you've mentioned, this is where it's happening. The soapbox the, or the podium that, that we refer to it as, I mean, that was the original speaker's corner where you would have had 2000 years ago, if somebody had a religious message, a political message or an ethical message that they wanted to share with the masses. That's where they're going to get up and speak. And right next to that podium, you have shops and stalls for people who on their way up to the temple need to get something for a temple offering. Maybe need to get a bottle of water or a hat or a souvenir. But you can see on the one hand, the economic life of, of Jerusalem 2000 years ago, the shops and the stalls, you see the podium where sermons would have been delivered. Uh, you have the actual flagstones leading up to the temple. And as you mentioned, it's an incline. And, and among the most famous uh, psalms attributed to King David are known as the Songs of Ascent. Now, what, what, what's, why are they called Songs of Ascent? Well, they would be said when a person was actually ascending up to the temple in Jerusalem. And when you're in the city of David, when you're on the actual pilgrimage road, and you see that in order to get up to the temple, you actually have to go uphill for a half mile. It's a song of ascent. You are singing those songs as you're ascending on a real road in a real Jerusalem, going up to a real temple. It's all real. Again, it's, it's not simply a matter of faith. It's a matter of fact. You could see it. You could touch it. And, and that's what makes it all the more ironic that you have uh, people in the Palestinian leadership, like Saeed Arakat, like Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority, who, in response to the discovery of the pilgrimage road, they say it's fake. It's not real. And, and it's just almost, if it wasn't sad, it would be laughable. That how, do you, how do you deny something of the magnitude of the pilgrimage road? We're not talking about like a little alleyway. We're talking about the biblical superhighway, a road that was walked upon by millions of people. You don't fake that. I mean, it, it's, you can see it with your own eyes. You can touch it with your own hands. You can walk on it with your own feet. And, and I think that that's why they are doing everything they can to stop the excavations in a place like the city of David, because they know that if God willing in the next three years or so, we're able to make that connection from the pool of Siloam all the way up to the footsteps of the Western Wall, of the Temple Mount. That's it. Meaning you will then have millions and millions of people from America, from all over the world, of all faiths and backgrounds, who will be able to say it's true. Our connection goes back to Jerusalem thousands of years. Israel is not a colonial state. We're not occupiers. We're not foreigners. Uh, for, the, for the tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of Americans who view their heritage and identity as being rooted uh, in the Bible, in that great biblical tradition, I say it's true. It's not just stories that I was told. You could prove it. You could see it. You could touch it. And, and that's inspiring, but also terrifying to those on the other side who are fighting against that as much as they can. Yeah. And, and what does that future look like? I mean, can we, do you think we'll get to a point where um, it's, it's no longer underground, but we, we excavate it to a point where we can have it above ground? I mean, I, although I think there's actually houses above the, uh, above the road right now, right? I mean, how, how do you think that looks from a practical standpoint? Like, and how, how will people it's, it's be largely, able to view this? So it's largely going to be underground. I mean, one of the challenges of Jerusalem, and this challenge you find in, in, in Greece, in Rome, is you have an ancient city that in many places is covered up by a modern one. Now, in the United States, you'd say, all right, we'll use eminent domain, and the government can, can you know, give everyone some money and clear out the neighborhood. In Jerusalem, for whether religious reasons and political reasons, that, that's not going to happen. And so today, the city of David is a mixed Jewish-Muslim neighborhood, and it's always going to remain so. That, that's not going to change. I don't think anyone has any plans to change uh, the makeup of the neighborhood. And so what's going to happen is that the excavations in the city of David, like the pilgrimage road, are going to take place while preserving the modern neighborhood above. So you're going to have modern Jerusalem above ancient biblical Jerusalem below, and, and really have a situation of the best of both worlds, uh, preserving the modern and covering the ancient, making it accessible to everyone, to the whole world, to come and see and connect with, with their heritage. That's, that's really what we're trying to do. Could you imagine that? I mean, you, you, you just discover that below your house, like literally below your house, was a place where it's almost certain that Jesus walked. And, uh, and, 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 and I mean, what a feeling that must be. I just, I can't even imagine how to react to that. I mean, what a, what a dinner conversation that is for people. And it's a very cool one. 
So today, archaeologists in the city of David, they're uncovering antiquities like seals with names and figures straight out of the Bible, inscriptions chiseled into stone affirming events that took place uh, uh, described in the Bible. Uh, imagine today you're sending correspondence to your members in Congress. You have encryption and encoding to ensure that no one's going to read your messages. But imagine two and a half thousand years ago, you're a government official and you don't have that same technology. How can you ensure that the only people who will read your mail are the intended recipients? So what you're going to do is you're going to write your letter, roll it up, tie it up. And then right before you hand it to the messenger, you're going to take a small piece of clay and you're going to put that clay on the knot. And then you're going to take your ring, your signet ring, which has on it your name and then son or daughter of your father's name. You will then imprint that into the clay. You hand it to the messenger. And when you then receive this letter, the first thing you do is check to make sure the seal isn't broken. And then you check to see what the name is. In excavations in the city of David, archaeologists have uncovered these small seals, the size of a thumbnail, with names straight out of the Bible. Names like the biblical Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, direct descendant of King David. I mean, you're talking about names of figures in the right historical context, straight out of the pages in the Bible. It's real. You could see it. You could touch it, which makes it all the more laughable when the United Nations and others are going and denying this heritage. And I think it's also one of the reasons why this administration, when they released their deal of the century uh, for their vision for peace in this region, they acknowledge that Jerusalem is going to remain the undivided capital of Israel, guaranteeing the freedom of worship and protection of all the holy places, but it was understood from the perspective of America that the only way to ensure that this heritage is preserved, and not just the heritage of, of, of Jerusalem and the Jewish people in Israel, but the heritage that matters so much to America and, and to countless millions of Americans to ensure that that heritage is protected and made accessible to people of all faiths and backgrounds, the only way that happens in this region is if Israel is sovereign in Jerusalem. And that's what really we're trying to do here is to make that heritage as accessible to as many people uh, as possible and to push back against those, whether at the United Nations or in the Palestinian leadership, who are trying to erase that heritage and, and literally to erase it, whether through the physical destruction of antiquities, uh, as was the case up on the Temple Mount, uh, where not long ago the, religious, the Islamic Religious Trust destroyed 400 truckloads of antiquities on the Temple Mount and dumped it in the garbage dump. Uh, or just to erase it from the history books. You have physical destruction of Jerusalem's history and heritage, and you also have the rewriting of that heritage in bodies like the United Nations and elsewhere. And the city of David is, is really at the forefront of ensuring that the physical heritage is going to be protected and preserved and made sure that it's open to everyone, and also to make sure that the actual heritage, the story, right. our so, shared story uh, how, how of is, Jerusalem is, is open. What, what is the United Nations doing exactly? Because that, that's pretty, it, it, you expect it from Palestinian leadership. That's not all that surprising. But to, but to hear that the United Nations is actively um, trying to thwart these efforts, what exactly are they doing? And, and, and how, how could they possibly advocate against the, the clear evidence? I mean, you, you, you've talked about some evidence just during this podcast, but there's obviously a lot more. I remember you showing me uh, actual coins, um, shekels from from that time period. So there's there's obviously mounting mm -hmm. evidence. Um, you guys have all presentations on this uh, that that every, everybody can have access to about all the the amazing archaeological discoveries and and just a written history that's been discovered in this area. So like the the the, the I guess the the evidence that there is a a Jewish and Christian connection to this area and that the, the stories of the Bible are, are, are real um, is overwhelming at this point. So what is the UN's argument? It, it, elaborate on that for me a little bit. All right. I'm just going to pause for one second. I'm going to answer that question, but we're about to have our moment of silence. Okay. Just Go ahead and I'll, and I'll explain I'll to listeners what that answer. is. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry about that. So for everybody listening uh, in Israel right now, it is their Memorial Day. And um, on their Memorial Day, they actually uh, pause for a moment of silence to honor the fallen. Uh, hence, hence that abrupt um, pause uh, in the podcast. So you were, you were, you were listening in real time and, and to real world events going on. All right. Zev is back. Um, yeah. So, Picking up where we left off, um, 
yeah, what 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 is the UN doing here? What, why 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 do we keep hearing uh, such an anti-Israel sen- sentiment in general uh, from the UN? Well, the, the UN is not just one entity. The UN obviously is made up of of countries around the world, and there are more than fifty Muslim states in the world. There is only one Jewish state in the world, and already, you know, putting it like that, it doesn't lead to uh, uh, great circumstances point. in the United Nations. And then you throw into that all sorts of political interests and economic interests and other interests that that various countries around the world have. And that does not work in Israel's favor uh, in a body like the United Nations. And really, it's it's more than just about Israel. You look at the United Nations Human Rights Council, where you have some of the worst human rights violators sitting on those bodies. Uh, it, it's not surprising. The United Nations, sadly, uh, its mission and mandate is uh, an admirable one. But in practice, it is generally most of the time not lived up to uh, its calling. And, and that can be seen no more better case than as it relates to Israel. Uh, And specifically, what you have in a body like UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, its mandate is to protect and preserve the cultural heritage of humanity, which is a very important mandate. And therefore, you would expect when it passes resolutions on a place like Jerusalem, that it would highlight the significance of Jerusalem. Yes, to Islam, from the perspective that, that Muslims feel a deep connection to Jerusalem, but all the more so to Christians and, and to Jews who have been there for thousands of years. And yet that is the very thing that's being erased. And why? Because the story that many in the Islamic world and certainly in Palestinian society uh, that's been told, and even in, in more and more parts of Europe today, is that Israel is a colonial project, that Israel has no legitimate historic ties to the region, to the Middle East in particular, to Israel and Jerusalem specifically. And therefore, you can't, at UNESCO, acknowledge the fact that, wait a minute, Jews and by extension Christians have been in Jerusalem for thousands of years because that undermines then the whole story. Then it becomes clear that the emperor is naked. And so they pass these ridiculous resolutions that even small children uh, with a basic uh, understanding of history would know is not true. But I'll tell you something more than that. I've, I've had the good fortune, you could say, to guide Dozens and dozens of United Nations ambassadors, both from the United Nations as a whole and from UNESCO specifically. And not one of them has ever said when they came through the city of David like you did, oh, this is BS, this is lies, this is not true. They're all moved, visibly moved. And so the question is, what's going on? How could it be that they're coming to the city of David? They see with their own eyes the history, and yet they deny it, and they're voting. And the answer is very simple, and it's an anecdote that goes back to 2016. 2016, when the first of this series of resolutions was was being voted on at UNESCO, the Mexican ambassador to UNESCO uh, reached out to his equivalent of the State Department and said, all right, these are the votes coming up over the course of this week. What are my instructions? And he tells them about the vote on Jerusalem. And they say, we're going to support this vote. Now, Mexico is a very Christian, a Catholic country. And he says, excuse me. Uh, maybe I didn't hear correctly, we're going to support this vote that denies the Jewish and Christian heritage in Jerusalem. And they said, yeah, that's what, we're going to support it. And he said, but it's not true. Well, okay, well, why should that matter? We're going to support it. And then when the vote came up and the Mexican ambassador did not follow the orders that he was given from, from his foreign office, you know what he was doing the next day? He was looking for a job. Right. And so all the other ambassadors look around and they're like, all right, we like being ambassadors. We like living in New York City. We like having drivers and nice apartments and all the perks that go along with the position. We're not going to fall on our sword over over debating Jerusalem's history from thousands of years ago. But wait, why? And, why and why so, was the Mexican uh, State Department? I, I'm, I can't even figure out why they were why they were against it. So what was what was going on behind the scenes there? I mean, the, the behind the scenes is very simple. You have even some of the United States' closest allies in Europe. They support these resolutions for, the, for a very simple reason. When they do the political calculus uh, in terms of whether to support or to oppose resolutions like this, it works out in the favor of we're going to support. Again, politically, economically, they have more to gain by supporting the resolutions than they do by opposing it. I'm just trying to figure out what the gain is, though. Practically speaking, I, 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 what what could possibly be the gain? I, I'm still sorry. I'm still not clear on that. 
I mean, I think it comes down to a, a lot of different things. One is to overall have good ties with the Islamic world, to have good political relations, to have good uh, economic relations. I mean, you would think, why is it controversial uh, for the United States to recognize that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel? I mean, why wouldn't the United States recognize that? But when they did that, I mean, the, the Palestinians, they're still not talking to the U.S. administration today because of that. And so many other countries, they don't have the courage to do what the United States did, which is to say, well, of course, Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. I mean, everyone knows these things, but, but they're not willing to publicly come out on the record because of the potential backlash that they're afraid of. Now, what's interesting is when the United States moved their embassy to Jerusalem, uh, there were many, even in the State Department, who were saying, no, no, it's a bad idea. It's going to lead to, to all sorts of conflict and violence. And in the end, nothing really happened. And so I think that there is a sense that there's a lot of fear of the reaction of the Muslim street, of the Arab street, and what that could mean for various countries. Uh, yeah. At the end of the day. Uh, yeah, I guess you're right. And it's just so ridiculous. You know, like you can't just stand up for what is so basically true. Um, and, and, you know, this is sort of, in a sense, it's a little bit of political correctness run amok. I mean, it's not quite a conversation about political correctness. It's more, I'm not even sure what to call it, but in, in any case, it's, it's a fear of, of standing up for the truth and, uh, really for no good reason. It, it, it is really sad. I'm proud to proud, proud that America has actually stood up for this truth. And it doesn't, it doesn't step on anybody's toes either. There, there's no, there should be no fear that that this truth gets revealed, right? It doesn't. It doesn't hurt it, in no way or shape or form. Should this hurt uh, the Palestinian cause or the Palestinian people? That's that you know to, to suggest so. I think would be ridiculous. But but as you noted, that that is the reaction that that, that, that sort of happens. Yeah, I mean, the only reason it, it hurts them is because the story that they've been telling for about a century is that. Jews have never been here. And therefore, when we pull something out of the ground, which shows clearly otherwise, well, then, yeah, it, it, it's a problem. When we uncover the pilgrimage road that says, wait a minute, 2,000 years ago, uh, there were Jews going up to a temple on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Well, then it's a problem. Whereas if they would just say, like, OK, well, we want this land. We think it belongs to us. OK, yeah, we get that. You also have a history here. And now we have a conflict and we need to work it out. OK, and there you'll then have political debates and, and resolutions and whatever ends up happening. But when one side says we do not recognize your existence, it's in a certain sense, to quote a friend of mine, it's national identity theft. Where what the Palestinians are trying to do is to steal our heritage, not just our land, but our heritage and to say you were never here. And the you, again, is very important because it's not you, meaning just me, Zev Ornstein or the Jewish people or Israelis. If, if I don't have a history in Jerusalem, if the Jewish people don't have a history in Jerusalem, then you as Americans, you as people who, who believe in the Judeo-Christian heritage, then you don't have, your heritage also isn't true. Because if the biblical heritage of Jerusalem, if it's not true for the Jews, well, then it's not true for the Christians either. If it's not true for Israel, then it's not true for America. And right. that's why when I meet with people like yourselves in the city of David, I say, this is not a, a, a pro-Israel issue. This is a pro-America issue because this is your heritage. This is like Gettysburg or, or Valley Forge or Plymouth Rock just 6,000 miles away. And when someone tries to undermine that heritage, they're trying to take away your heritage too, not just mine. Yeah. No, and it's just so disappointing. I mean, in the coronavirus era, our international institutions have uh, been discredited widely. The World Health Organization being among them, the UN has lost standing in enormous ways for, for, for reasons like this, UNESCO and the Human Rights Council just being so blatantly and obviously corrupted from the core. And um, it's, it's, it's a real shift, I think, in global politics. And, you know, that's a, that's, that's a, that's a conversation for another time. These are important institutions, especially as, as, as institutions for countries to go and to speak to each other. Um, but as institutions of any authority, I think they've got a long way to go to gain any credibility. Um, Zev, that's, uh, I think that about sums it all up. Is there anything uh, else we didn't talk about that you'd want to add? Um, it's a fascinating discussion on the, on the importance of the city of David. I don't think a lot of people realize what's going on with that right now and, and how recent this discovery is and how amazing it is for, uh, for humanity really. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'll just say, come see it for yourself. Don't take my word for it alone. Uh, you could come, you could see it, you could walk through the excavations, you could walk along the pilgrimage road, see it with your own eyes, touch it with your own hands, uh, walk on it with your own feet, and, and it's, it's your heritage too, and, and don't let anyone take it away from you. It's a great, great message to leave with, and uh, thanks so much, Seth, for being on the podcast. It was a really fascinating discussion. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me.